This is the solution to question 1, paper 2 of the SQA's Curriculum for Excellence Specimen Higher Exam. Given a picture of a square-based pyramid, it's a right pyramid, which means D is directly above the centre of the square base, and we're given various units, distances and coordinates and so on. And our task in the first part of the question is to find the coordinates of E and F. So let's first of all work on a larger diagram. So let's try and track down the coordinates of the point F. Now we're told that the each side of the square base has length 60 units. We're told that F divides AB in the ratio 2 to 1. So in particular this part A to F would be 2 bits and this part F to B would be 1 bit. That's three bits in total, and if 60 units is the length of AB, then each bit must be 20 units long. So two bits will be 40. So this length is 40 units, and this length is 20, making up a total of 60 and a ratio 2 to 1 for F. So the coordinates of F, we finally got there. The x-coordinate of F would be... 60. We then move 40 units parallel to the y-axis and we never leave the base that the pyramid is sitting on. So we don't move up at all parallel to the z-axis. So it's a height of 0. So z-coordinate is 0. So we have 60, 40, 0 for F. Let's now attempt to get the coordinates of E. E, we know, is the midpoint of D, B. So to track down where E is, we first should really find out D's coordinates. Well, fortunately we're told that is 30, 30, 80. And B's coordinates, in a similar way to how we find the coordinates of F, we go 60 units along the x-axis and then 60 units parallel to the y-axis to get to B. And again, it's a height of zero. It's sitting on the plane that the pyramid sits on. So 60, 60, zero. And we know E is the midpoint of the line DB. So to get the coordinates of E, let's first of all look at the x-coordinates of D and B. So we're travelling from 30 to 60. And that's a distance of 15 units parallel to the... Sorry, 30 units parallel to the x-axis. So halfway uh, along would be 15 units. So 30 plus a 15 is 45. We've travelled... 15 units along parallel to the x-axis to get from D to E. And a further 15 units along the x-axis will get us to B, where the x-coordinate is 60. Let's do the same for the y-coordinates. Um, D is at a distance of 30 units along the y-axis. B is 60 units along the y-axis. And again, that's a distance of 30. Half that distance is 15. So again, we're travelling uh, 15 units from this 30. That gets us to 45 along the y-axis. And then a further 15 gets us to 60 units along the y-axis. And finally, the z-coordinate. D is at a height of 80 above this base. B is on the base. So we've travelled 80 units to go from D down to B. So 40 units would take us halfway there. So E must be at a height of 40 above the base, Z coordinate of 40. So there's the coordinates of E and F. Part 
Part B. We're asked to find the dot product of ED and EF. So first of all, let's find what we're doing in our journey travelling from E to D. Now we can do that in terms of position vectors, little d minus little e. Travelling from the origin to d in components would be 30, 30, 80. Travelling from the origin to e, components 45, 45, 40. So that gives us 30 minus 45 is minus 15 for the x component. 30 minus 45 again is minus 15, and 80 minus 40 is 40. Now that's something we could also have figured out by saying, what do we do travelling from E to D? X coordinate, we've gone from 45 to 30, so we've gone minus 15. We've travelled parallel to the y-axis from 45 to 30, so that's another minus 15 units. And for the z-coordinates, we were at a height of 40, we've travelled up to 80. That's an increase of 40 units. Anyway, there's the coordinates of E to D. Similarly, we'll do the coordinates of E to F. That's position vector of F minus position vector of E. Position vector of F travelling from the origin to F. Components, 60 40, 0. The components of position vector E travelling from the origin to E is 45, 45, 40. So for X component, 60 minus 45 is a positive 15. And 40 minus 40, 45, 40 minus 45 is minus 5. And 0 minus 40 is negative 40 for the Z component. So we're now in a position to work out the dot product of ED and EF. We have the two components. It's minus 15, minus 15, 40. And we have... Components 15, negative 5, negative 40. So remember, to work out dot product, we multiply the two x's, multiply the two y's, multiply the two z's, and then add the, add the result. So we've got minus 15 times 15, plus minus 15 times minus 5, plus 40, times negative 40. Uh, minus 15 times 15 is minus 225. Negative times negative is positive 5 15s or 75. And 40 times negative 40, that would be negative 1600. So let's finally do that calculation. So negative 225 plus 75 minus 1,600. So that gives us negative 1,750. So let's move on to the last part of this question. It says, hence or otherwise, calculate the size of angle D, E, F. That's the angle between the vector E, D and the vector E, F. Let's call this vector V and this one vector W. Let's call this angle theta. The result we're going to use is that cos theta is equal to V dot W over magnitude of V times the magnitude of W. Now remember the two vectors, if you're finding an angle between, they must move out, the arrows must go out from the vertex of the angle, which is what is going on here. So V dot W, that's 
the dot product we've calculated in part B. It's ED dot EF. And the answer we got to that was minus 1750 or negative 1750. So next up we'll calculate the magnitude of V. That's from E to D. And we had worked out the components of E to D. And so it's the magnitude of negative 15 negative 15, 40. And the result we use, square root of x component squared, y component squared, z component squared, and the sum of all of these. So negative 15 squared, 225, another 225, another 1600, square root of that, and that comes to 450, and another 1,600 is 2,050. So it's square root of 2,050. Similar calculation for the magnitude of W. The components of that, we discovered earlier, that's from E to F. That's 15 minus 5 minus 40. So that would be the square root of 15 squared, negative 5 squared, negative 40 squared, sum of these three. So there's another 2 to 5, that's 25. Remember negative, squaring a negative number is always positive. There's 1, 6, 0, 0. So that's the sum we're doing. So there's 250 added on to 1,600 which is 1,850 square root of. So, so far, so good. We've calculated all of these. We could put them in position up here, 1,750 negative. And on the bottom of the fraction, we've got square root of 2,050 times square root of 1850. So a negative number. So we certainly need a calculator to get through this one. So let's clear everything. And let's do 1750 divided by the whole of the bottom line. So let's put all that in brackets. So we've got the square root of uh, where are we? 2050. Zero, zero. So that's first square root multiplied by the square root of 1850. Oh. And all of that divided into 1750. Oh. And it's negative. So let's just look at that. So there's the number there. Uh, so it's equal to negative 0 0.898 and so on, with the very accurate result there. And to get the value of theta, we must do an inverse cosine now. And remember the angle between two vectors lies between zero, we can get a very small angle, um, anywhere up to 180 or pi radians. It can't go beyond pi radians. If we were down here with angle, we'd use the, the acute angle, sorry, the obtuse angle in here. So we wouldn't go beyond 180. So angle between two vectors lies between zero and pi radians. So in this case, with the cosine being negative, remember the all sine tan cos diagram, cosine is negative in the second quadrant. So we know it would be uh, 180 minus whatever the first quadrant angle is. So we would use this positive value, do an inverse cosine on that answer, 
and we get an angle of 26 degrees, 26.0 degrees to one decimal place. So it'll be 180 minus 26. So 180 minus 26.0 degrees. And it's 154.0 degrees to one decimal place.